Pond Boss, Fish Behavior. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do <laughs> to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, Chico. How are you, my friend? You know, life is pretty good. You know what? It really is, isn't it? Yeah. We, I have no complaints. Hey, let's go fishing. <laughs> Oh, wait, let's record a podcast let's do about podcasts. fishing, you know? We, we get to fish all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, hey, right. let's talk about fish yeah. behavior. Okay. So, uh, you love to fish out of your kayak. Yes, I do. You know, and so, so when you're getting ready to go fishing, do you give any thought to fish behavior when you're getting ready to pattern fish and go catch them, or do you just kind of launch the kayak, get your gear, go, go, go? What? Do you, how do you do that? You know, in all of the prep, either, you know, I don't do tournament stuff anymore, but my day of prep, not really, no. It, in fact, that would be the last thing. It'd be more of where am I going? What am I hunting for? I, 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 more than anything, it's that. You know, are we going to go We're looking for black bass today? Stripers, you know, fish for whites, catfishing. Okay, so what it? determines that? So if you're going to go... What what makes you decide I'm going to go fishing for sand bass, white bass? Yeah, see, so Why? it would be the Why? behavior. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. So good point. I so think you're thinking about point. you're thinking about your what you're going to target based on conditions the, like weather. Yes, and species, or and, it's and a, which what lake a, you're going to. A good to. time for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So a good bite. Weather affects fish behavior. Yeah, it does. And I tell you something's really interesting, and and I learned this. Right out of college in 1980, a, a partner and I leased a fish farm, a catfish farm, and near Wichita Falls, Texas. And we had a, a big uh, homemade hopper feeder that blew feed in the water for the catfish. Mm -hmm. And boy, right before a cold front would blow through, those catfish would eat like crazy. And I mean, they would just gorge themselves with as much food as they could. Then the cold front would blow through. And then the next two or three days, they wouldn't Nothing. eat much at all. Yeah. Okay. You know, so that's when I started kind of figuring out that that some of these weather patterns make a big difference. And I think you know every angler really knows post front you're not going to go fishing. Greetings, Bob Lusk here, editor of Pond Boss Magazine and longtime fisheries biologist. Welcome to the Pond Boss Podcast Series. Got some great topics lined up for you. Glad you're coming along. We are brought to you by Purina Mills, makers of Aquamax Fish Foods, Texas Hunter Products, makers of fantastic fish feeders and other hunting products, Easy Docs, and HuntBirdDog.com. We're glad you're here. Let's go have some fun together and get our learning curve up. Well, here's what happens. The lateral line on the side of the fish. Every fish has a lateral line. You know, you can see it in a largemouth bass. You can see it in crappie. If you look for it, what that is, is that's a hollow tube that connects to the brain. And it senses pressure because it's got, it's got gas in it. So when the pressure changes in the water, it sends a stimulus to the brain where that fish instinctively gets the sense that something bad's fixing to happen or things are going to change. A barometer. So the barometer, yeah. it, they, they can sense the barometric pressure change in the water with their lateral line. They can also sense movement. So, for example, if there's a big bass laying low over by that big log and a school of shad swims by, the movement in the water, that bass can sense it. But here's what's cool about that. It senses that school of shad as one big fish. Oh, really? So it yeah. doesn't know this is a It doesn't know that it's a whole bunch of little bitty fish until it goes to investigate. So bigger bass, they get to the point where they're conditioned enough to sense that movement and the way that senses to their brain to turn and go look and investigate and head toward it. So they don't necessarily see in the dark. No, they, they can't. can't. No, they can't see yes. in the dark. And if the water's very cloudy, they can't see very far. So right. it all starts with movement. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how it starts. So fish behavior, the lateral line detects pressure. Girlfriend. Our dog sees company. <laughs> yeah, or a deer, I think. <laughs> or it something. Might be, might, be, might be a deer in the yard. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, you know, fish behavior is really interesting. And then, like spawning behavior, for example, you know, that that's a trigger mm -hmm. that makes other fish come. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, like when the bluegills get on the bed, they're, 
They're crater spawners and colony spawners. They spawn in big colonies. There might be 50 bluegill in an area as big as a pickup truck, and they've all got their own little crater just running in circles around and around and around mm -hmm. and uh, hatching their eggs. You know, so fish behavior is pretty big. Uh, shad behavior, they run in schools, they flip, they dart, threadfin shad, they have to keep swimming 24 7. Did you know that? No. They don't have a swim bladder. So if they don't swim, they sink. So they swim in like size schools, I mean, a like size fish per school. So all the shad in that school might be three inches long. You're not going to find six inch threadfin shad swimming with a whole bunch of two inch shad. Yeah. So they're all uniform and it looks like senses like one big fish swimming through the water. Uh, sunfish behavior is different. You know, sunfish, their innate uh, sense is that they're going to get eaten. So I've, I've worked on lakes where I could go out in the lake and start electrofishing and pick up bluegill out in the middle of the lake, maybe near a stick up that's in fairly shallow water, like in an old rice reservoir, for mm -hmm. example. But it doesn't take long to see there's not many bass in that lake or those bluegill would not would be not out be there. in the open like that's that. That's right. They're yeah. going to move back into yeah. more dense structure mm -hmm. where they have protection. You know, and the spawning behavior is different. Threadfin shad start running the edge of the water just before daylight and they spawn until about 30 minutes after daylight. Then they go back out to deep water and feed. You know, there's, and there's no parental care at all. They lay their eggs on grass then they leave, wish the eggs luck. Cut them loose. Just go. Wow. You know, in gizzard shad, for example, when they dump their eggs, they might dump a quarter of a million eggs at a time. And those are semi-buoyant, and some will hatch, some won't. You know, so all these different behaviors. Fathead minnows, for example, they stick their eggs on the underneath sides of firm objects, like rocks and docks and tree trunks and plastic, stuff like that. So... And then they, then the, then the daddy fat Ed minnow guards that nest. That's why they call him a fat Ed minnow. He's got a little knot on his head with little bumps right. called tubercles. There's our big word. For the day. Tubercles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so he's he's guarding that nest. So all these different fish have different behavior patterns. And when you're going fishing, that's part of what you're looking for. Without thinking about it, yeah, it is. It's, it, it drives it a lot. And, you know, again, it's like if we're looking for stripers, that's what we're looking for. It's that behavior. Um, exactly. It, like, like when they're chasing top water. Exactly. You know, when they, when they drive that school of shad to the surface and blow up onto them, you know, at the surface of the water, that behavior was triggered. Mm hmm which oh. is a, an amazing day when that is occurring. It sure it is. It really it is. Sure is. <laughs> and when you look at it, you know, those shad have grown to a certain point. Mm -hmm. It's a certain time of the year. They're living in a certain part of the lake. And then the predator fish figure it out. And you pretty well bet for every one of those fish hitting at the surface, there's fish below them that are trying to catch the leftovers. The oh, injured yeah. shad, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So all this cool stuff's going on underwater, and it's all about fish behavior. Yeah. So if we're students. Like in, as in a bass, they're so driven by the temperature. Is there a time when, when you hear about a fish feeding frenzy? Mm -hmm. Is that really what's happening is you're seeing the, the shad activity? You're seeing the bait fish activity? That's a big part of it. And you, the time that you see, and, and the behavior is also driven by temperature, but it's also driven by a season. For example, in the fall, you know, the bait fish food population is pretty much at its peak. And those bigger predator fish sense that the photo periods are getting shorter, days are getting shorter. Yeah. And they've got to really get themselves in the best condition they can going into the winter because winter's going to be stressful. Time to if, fatten up. That's right. So then they just, of course, the water's going to start cooling off and getting into their prime temperature. And prime temperature's different for each species of fish. That's just not fair. <laughs> There's just something wrong yeah, about that. Yeah, if you think about it, rainbow trout's prime operating <laughs> temperature's in the 50s. Mm -hmm. You know, where largemouth bass prime temperature's is in the 70s. You know, Bluegill, for example, their prime temperatures from the 70s to the mid 80s. You know, so all these different species of fish behavior is also influenced by the temperature of the water. So when you're out there getting ready to go fishing, think about the way fish behave. And if you spend a little bit of time thinking about that, 
then your odds of catching some fish are probably going to go up because it'll be a little easier to pattern them. Angler behavior. Angler behavior. Boy, that's a whole nother deal right there. I'm not qualified to talk about that. None of us are. (laughs) So, hey, Chico, let's wrap this one up, buddy. And uh, we'll add some photographs to it, and you'll see what we're talking about with some of these things. And uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, go to pondboss.com. Also, check out our Facebook page because we got a lot of cool things there. At pondboss.com, we got a lot of free articles. We've got a lot of uh, um, videos that are posted up there. And Ask the Boss uh, discussion forum that's been there since 2002. And uh, that's kind of old school, but it is the school. It mm-hmm. has got lots and lots of information. And hey, Pond Boss Magazine. This is, this is what fuels the economy of what we do. 35 bucks a year, uh, bi-monthly publication, it's full of nuggets. As a matter of fact, every time I talk to somebody, it's common for them to say, you know, I read it from cover to cover, and I always get one or two or three things out of there. I hear that a lot. I do too. A lot. And I, I call those nuggets. So, hey, listen, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Wow, that was pretty fun, huh? I'm so glad that you joined us. Say, if you're looking for more information, I want you to head over to pondboss.com. We've got all kinds of cool information and been there forever. It's got some of the best articles, topics, got the Ask the Boss discussion forum. And be sure to check out the Institute of Higher Pondology online as well. And subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. That's what fuels the economy of what we're doing to help us put these shows on. So until next time, we'll see you then. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true.